For those of you who don't know much about Lippincott, we're a creative consultancy that's focused on really working with a diverse range of companies to create high-impact brands. And the core of the Lippincott business, and we've been around for about 70 years, is brand strategy and then logo and identity system development. But as we've worked with brands over the last five to 10 years, we found that it's been really important for us to think about brand as much broader than that. And so we've done a lot of work with our leading clients around how they innovate their experiences to bring their brands to life. And when we do that, we start with an understanding of what they're trying to do with the brand, what attributes they're trying to represent. We typically also then will make sure we understand what are the customer needs they're trying to address, what are the market trends out there. But one of the things we've been doing more recently, and, and the thing I wanted to talk to you about today, is actually try to take a, a behavioral economics and a psychological view of how customers make decisions and weave that into the experiences we build. So that's going to be the focus for me for the next uh, 19 minutes or so. And I want to start that by taking you out of this wonderful but somewhat industrial space and back to uh, your last vacation that you took. Maybe it was on the beach somewhere, really nice. Maybe it was in an exciting city. And ask you to just reflect on it for a minute. And I think. What most people find is that the memory of that vacation is often a really nice, happy feeling. You know, it takes you back to that experience, puts you back in it. Uh, but also the anticipation that people have for those vacation moments are also really powerful. And so what I'm going to talk today about is not just the experience itself of a vacation or any other experience you might be involved in, but the notion of that before and that after and how all of that impacts how we think about experiences and how we really connect with and which experiences make us happy as a result. And the reason to focus on that at all is that in the work we do, uh, our goal is always to create this strong emotional connection between brand and customer. And what we found in the research that we do is that for an emotionally powerful brand, about 25% of the connection they create with customers is actually through traditional communications and storytelling about the brand. And fully 75% of it is actually delivered through the experience itself. And that's particularly true for high involvement brands like many of you are involved with in the travel industry. So it's really critical to think about how do we make the experience be an emotional one and one that connects with customers. And that's particularly valuable and particularly important because emotional connection is actually worth a lot. And this is some data from Motista, which is a company that focuses on optimizing emotional connection between customers and brands. And their data suggests that an emotionally connected customer is worth as much as twice as much as one that's just simply satisfied with a company and its offering. So it's a really high stakes, high value thing to be focused on creating that emotional connection between company and customer. And as a result, a lot of companies focus on what are those signature experience moments that help create that connection. So for instance, Starbucks with the signature name on the cup or the Tiffany blue box, or the fact that the Southwest in-flight safety demonstration is particularly quirky and personable. The fact that Cold Stone Creamery does a whole routine around the mix-ins and the making of your ice cream cone, and even the fish that you can get at Kimpton Hotels. All of those are little signature experiences that are designed to create that emotional connection between customer and brand. And so what we see is a lot of companies get that and they know that they need to think about how does that experience work, how does the interaction really, really optimize the relationship with customers. Uh, but what we find is that companies do a couple of things related to really focusing on the, the narrow definition of that interaction, the interaction from, in the case of the vacation, from arrival to experiencing the lobby amenities of the hotel, the room, the dining, the facilities. And a lot of the questions that get focused on in terms of really trying to understand and manage that experience are things like, what matters most? So asking this very functional question about what do, what do the customers really care about? What could we be doing better? And how do we compare to other competitors? But the challenge with that is that's not actually how the brain typically works in terms of how we form 
the strongest memories, the strongest associations that we have with brands and with experiences. And there's kind of two dimensions of how the brain works that we try to incorporate into our own experience design work that we do. The first is that that anticipation that I mentioned is actually typically stronger than the interaction itself. And there have been a lot of studies on this. The fact that you're thinking about the trip, you're reading about it, you're planning your itinerary, you're talking to friends about where they went and what they did, is actually often more impactful and more powerful than actually undertaking the trip itself. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is rooted in evolution and the fact that our wanting system that drives us forward is actually stronger than our liking system. And the wanting system is powered by dopamine and we get a hit every time we take that step forward and go on that journey or seek that outcome. And the liking system is driven by opioids in our brain system. And it drives a more sense of well-being and complacency. And if you think about us historically and you go back to our caveman roots, what you see is that uh, if you just were really emphasizing this liking system and that was the dominant driver of our behaviors, you know, you'd, you'd get complacent, you'd die out, the saber-toothed tiger would get you. And so we're driven by a wanting system that makes anticipation very, very strong and that seeking function very, very strong. The other side of this is that anticipation is often very idealized, whereas interaction isn't. And so you can anticipate this beautiful, flawless beach you know, no crowds, cool sand, and the reality is often very different. Sand in your shorts, you're sunburned, etc. And so that ability to tap into anticipation and really take advantage of that is an important aspect of building experiences that drive emotional connection, that drive happiness in customers. And there are a couple of ways that companies can do this. Um, you can tease. By teasing the customer with what they might have access to, you really start to spur that anticipation. Good example of this is Equinox, when it ran its gold member program recently, it was a membership level that was only available to those who found the 20 gold cards that were scattered around the city, some in places like at the bottom of the bay. And it really spurred people to, to really want and aspire for that. And, and that teasing really kind of built anticipation. Another example is what Four Seasons Hotels has done with Pinterest, where when you're visiting a location like Hong Kong, they've got a Pinterest relationship where you can set up a Pinterest site, start to build your idealized itinerary, have people from the hotel and third parties start to add to it, and really tempt you with this really great idealized itinerary that other local experts have, have uh, played into. And then another great example that's actually uh, from Mark's company is Treat, which is the notion of um, taking something that can be mundane like a business trip and making it a treat, in this case by having a sleep menu at the Andaz Hotel that allows you to pick everything from uh, the, the pillow type to actually, and this is the Andaz in Shanghai, you can actually get the toilet color that you want based on the LED lighting. So just some ex examples of kind of adding this dimension of tease, tempt, and treat to build anticipation uh, for your customers and actually create that higher impact experience. But it's not just that anticipation. In fact, most companies do a reasonably good job at anticipating and trying to draw customers into their experience. Where we think there's a particularly large opportunity is with regard to afterglow, the notion of creating that remembrance and that sense of fond recollection for the experience that somebody's had, and that that represents a significant opportunity. And the reason it does is, again, because of the way the brain works. To quote Daniel Kahneman, who is a, a leading psychologist in the area of remembrance, thinking, uh, brain decision making. Um, he says, memories are all we get to keep from our experience of living. In decision making, the experiencing self doesn't really have a voice because once you're done experiencing, it becomes a memory. And so the remembering self is sometimes wrong. We can fool ourselves or we can have memories that aren't totally accurate but it's the one that keeps score. When people ask you about the experience they had, this is what's really answering, is, is your remembrance, your remembering self, and how you think about that decision. And what confounds that or makes it complex and interesting is the fact that there's actually two parts to our decision-making system and our thinking system. There's a part called system one, which is based in the oldest, earliest part of our brain, the core, and this is the system that does fast intuitive thinking, it associates, integrates, and intuits, and it imprints emotions and subconscious memories into heuristics or rules of thumb. So for instance, when you can tell that somebody's angry, 
you're typically using system one to just quickly, without even really consciously thinking about it, make that determination. That's system one thinking. System two thinking is actually in our frontal cortex. It's evolutionary, much more recent as a thinking function. It's slow, deliberate, it analyzes, it follows rules, it, requires, it actually requires physical effort, and they can actually measure how much system two thinking you're doing by how much your pupils dilate throughout problem solving. And system two is what you might use, for instance, if you were told to pick out in a crowd um, everybody with white hair. You'd have to scan the crowd, you'd have to compare and contrast the people that you see to, the, to your perception of what white hair is. That takes physical work. That's system two thinking. And the challenge and the opportunity is that, again, evolutionarily this makes sense. 95% of all decisions are actually made as system one decisions. We, we as uh, humans try to minimize the amount of effort that goes into thinking. If we had to think carefully about everything we did, again, we'd probably get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, we'd waste a lot of time and energy. So what we do and what our brain does is say, anything that I can decide very quickly in system one, I will do so. And I'm only going to apply system two in those rare instances where I actually need to make more thoughtful decision making. And the challenge with a lot of work around customer experience design and development is that we spend a lot of time asking rational questions in a system two context of people when that isn't how they actually experienced or thought about the interaction. And so what we've been trying to do increasingly with our own experience design work is to, to think about what are some of those system one dimensions that drive decision making and that we can be cognizant of as we design experiences. And there are a couple of rules around how system one tends to work. The first is that our brains tend to think and remember most strongly peak events and the last event in a sequence. We don't average the whole experience, we remember those couple. And as a result, we also do something called duration neglect. We don't tend to think about how long an experience was and whether one was you know, not quite as good as another but lasted twice as long. We just simply think in terms of that peak and that end. And then we tend to be very story biased. We tend to want to put experiences into context by telling a story about them, making them make sense in that way. And so again, experiences that can be easily encapsulated in a story become ones that are richer and that are more strongly remembered. A quick example of this in action is uh, a famous experiment that was done uh, where they took folks and they put their hands in really cold water for 30 seconds and it was unpleasant. They took another group of folks, put their hands in that same cold water for those 30 seconds, and then took slightly warmer water that was still unpleasant and put their hands, that group's hands in that water for another 30 seconds. So there was one group that had their hands in really unpleasantly cold water for twice as long. That group actually rated the experience better because the last part of it actually felt better. So they actually preferred to endure this, this pain for longer uh, because it ended, that, that end experience was better. And so that's a little bit of this uh, in your brain at work in this realm. So there's this opportunity to really think about how we end experiences and we think about that, the, the last part of them in a way that actually creates that, that sense of connection, that happiness that drives emotional bond. But we don't actually often think about that. We do a lot of work to think about how do we get people into our experience, how do we get them into the beginning of our purchase funnel, uh, and we don't do a lot around how do we really make the, the, the remembrance of this experience strong. And uh, just to illustrate this with, a, I think, a, a cute clip, and you can never go wrong with an Amy Schumer video, I've got a little bit of an Amy Schumer video that just kind of brings this to life. Unfortunately, all the dirty parts are cut out. Welcome to the U. I would love so much to help you today. I'm checking in. That would be my great pleasure. May I offer you a kumquat and elderflower julep? Yeah, thank you. No, thank you, really. This is a welcome home. Oh, this is huge. You could fit three people in here. You look radiant. Take a look at yourself in the mirror. See what I see. Hello, Angel. Oh my God. Can I tuck you in? Good morning. Late checkout? Is it? It's after 11. I'm going to have to charge you for another day. It's like five after. Should I just leave that all on the visa? It's me. All on the visa, ma'am? Yeah, I guess. This woman is no longer a guest at the hotel? She's done. She's done talking to you. Wait, this way, uh, ma'am. She's wait. done. 
Oh, no, no. I, I think she just didn't recognize me. Wait. Okay. Well, let me just... Hi, I'm checking in. Oh, I love that scarf. Is that Egyptian silk? Okay, so that may be a little bit exaggerated, but, but it, it's not outrageously exaggerated. So what are some of the ways that we can borrow from uh, the way our brain works and the system one imprinting of positive memories uh, to, to build them into our experiences a little bit more? So here are just a couple examples. First notion is to end strong and to make that end experience a little less of the bouncer throwing you out of the hotel. Good example of this, doesn't spend a lot of money, but just makes a nice little gesture is uh, the fast casual chain Oaxaca, which is based in the UK. It's a Mexican chain. It's known for its particularly spicy food, at least by UK standards. And uh, what they do is uh, when they give you the check at the end of the meal, they give you this little packet that also includes a bunch of pepper seeds. And those are for you to just take home and plant if you'd like. So it just is a simple little gesture that is a trademark moment that turns what is otherwise very transactional and, and you know, a bit of a letdown into something simple and nice and that uh, if you actually manage to plant the seed and grow it stays with you for quite a long time. Another example of ending strong that I think is, is a nice one is Black Tomato, the higher end uh, travel service. What they do is at the end of a trip, they give you a credit that pays for laundry service and takeout food. Because if you think about the trip, you've got this wonderful 10 day vacation, you come home to a house with no clean laundry, nothing in the refrigerator, and that's actually the very last part of the trip, is that kind of coming home to the reality of everything being somewhat chaotic and un unorganized. And so what they do is they say, well, we're going to make that last little part of your trip also a little bit pampered and special, and we're going to give you that, that takeout and that, that laundry service. So again, a nice example of just doing something fairly simple that takes a, a down ending and makes it a little bit stronger. Another thing that you can do that's related to this notion of finding those peaks is actually build surprise into the experience. And I think Uber is a particularly good example of this because you know, Uber is interesting. From a functional perspective, they've taken an experience and they've really rationalized it and simplified it and taken some of the anxiety out of you know, what little anxiety there is in finding a cab and negotiating the fare, et cetera. And so you could, you could imagine they would rest on their laurels with simply having achieved that and driving tremendous growth. But they actually work to build a lot of surprise moments into the brand experience. And, and they do it pretty consistently across all dimensions of the experience. So everything from providing ice cream on hot uh, summer days to Uber Eats, which has another kind of interesting, you know, available for only that day, food offering each day. Uh, in Seattle, they had a Mad Max offering where they'd come pick you up. If you were lucky enough, they'd arrive in one of these Mad Max cars and you could ride around in that. Um, in the UK, they've, they've done situations where you get in the car and you find that you have the opportunity to go to a surprise concert by a well-known local band. And so lots of things that they build into that experience to just add that dimension of surprise and that connection and that buzzworthy point. Another great example of this, I think, is 11 Madison Park, the restaurant here in New York. It's a Michelin three-star restaurant, so incredibly good food. And you would imagine that a restaurant that focuses aggressively on uh, food like that wouldn't think about other dimensions of the experience, but they actually have a person on staff they call the Dreamweaver, whose whole focus is to find other surprising moments to add delight to the experience. And just one example of this is there was a couple from Spain who was at the restaurant, and their kids were back in a hotel on Central Park South. It was actually snowing out. They were texting back and forth with the kids, which the waiter picked up on. The kids were super excited. They had never seen snow. It was really coming down. They were really looking forward to potentially going sledding in Central Park the next day. So overhearing that, the, the, the restaurant Streamweaver went out to a local hardware store, bought two sleds, brought them back, stenciled them with the 11 Madison Park logo, and presented them to the couple along with a handwritten map of the best sledding hills in Central Park on their departure from the restaurant. And that's just one of lots of different examples where they've done things like that. And you can imagine that for that couple, the food was not the highlight of that visit or what they're talking about or remembering. It was the surprise built in around it. Also opportunities to take an experience and reinforce the best parts of it. So for instance, the Intercontinental Hotel, if you have a great meal there, you can go online, find the recipe, build a recipe book, uh, use that, share it, et cetera, as a way of remembering and continuing to reinforce the positive aspects of the visit. And then I think a good example of rewiring is actually Zappos, which one of the things they find is that 
If you actually dwell on a negative experience, it doesn't make it better. It actually just imprints it. So if you can quickly turn it into a fun, positive experience, you're much better off in terms of service recovery. And so they're very good at that for everything from training their folks to handle all kinds of outlandish requests that come in to uh, very personalized and fun sorry letters to gift cards they hand out, et cetera. So they do a great job of just kind of rewiring bad experiences when they occur. So just to wrap it up, we think that you should make sure you're doing a couple things. One is stretching your definition of the experience you're delivering to really be very early in that anticipation stage and also trailing deeply into that remembrance and after stage and making sure that you're both embracing the excitement of anticipation but also capitalizing on the warmth of afterglow. And in addition, you should be doing that in the context of an approach to experience design that's holistic and treats it as an integrated customer experience from the perspective the customer brings to it. Often companies approach experience from the various functional offerings that they have and the touch points and the handoffs, and that isn't how a customer experiences you. So be holistic. Find those signature moments that really make you stand out. In a lot of services, there's a lot of commoditization of the basics of the offering. So really understanding where are those signature moments that are going to be the shorthand for your brand when people talk about you and making sure that you really build those to be first class. And then third being balanced and execution between shorter term and longer term as well as between more creative and more cost benefit oriented and making sure that you balance all of that and how you approach experience design. And the reason this matters is because when Forrester went out and did a survey of executives and customers, what they found was that 95% of executives said, yeah, we believe customer experience is really important and it's getting more important. 80% of those executives also believed that they were delivering a better customer experience. And 8% of customers actually agreed. So there's this big gap between what you think you're doing in most businesses and what customers are perceiving. And it's growing as customers get to perceive the best of the best across all different industries. They're bringing whatever leading edge experience they've got in one category to every other category. And so just to conclude, we think that you need to make sure that you are building excitement by teasing, setting the dopamine off by tempting, fueling fantasies by making even the mundane a treat, and at the same time, ending strong with that nice grace note, setting memories with surprise, and rewiring and reinforcing memories in your favor. So those are the things we think you should keep in mind as you approach experience design and look to take advantage of, of how we actually think and imprint memories and create happiness. So think about that anticipation, think about that afterglow, and create that happiness and that emotional connection with your customers. Thank you. Thank you.